Hi everyone, and I hope you are not tired of all of the like Victorian Kate spam. This was a video I actually was not able to fit in during Victober, so hopefully people there are still interested in hearing me talk about Victorian literature. But this was a video inspired when I realized there is a certain aesthetic that I love in Victorian novels that I have happened upon five times in Victorian novels, maybe more times if I thought about it. But these are the first five books that I thought of. And that is the otherworldly feel to these books. These are books where like the atmosphere is really gothic and intense and the weather is really intense and the landscape is so dramatic that it almost feels like fantasy. I hope this idea conveys to you all, but just so over the top and almost different enough from reality that it feels like fantasy. The emotions, the landscape, the weather, like I said, are just all very heightened. And I don't know how to explain it, but there's something about that that I love. I love the intensity. I love when I read a book, like I want to feel the feelings and I want, I want to be moved by it. And so these are books that I felt all the feelings and I was very moved by them. And the first one, classic, and what some of you may have guessed, and that is Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. This is a very divisive book. And I totally, I like, I very much sympathize with you people who you readers, you people, sounds like I'm insulting you. <laughs> and I sympathize with readers who don't necessarily love Wuthering Heights. It is very, um, like, it doesn't hold back at all. She comes out the gate swinging with this book and there are ghosts and, um, or say, you know, people claiming they see ghosts and there are, is, or there are intense storms. Um, there are people who do the most atrocious and despicable things. Um, just really kind of thinking of all the ways that you can kind of hurt the ones that are near and dear to you is going to be in Wuthering Heights. Um, but something about it, something about getting uh, so up close and personal with characters. And I find in these books that I'm, that I've put in this category, something about the landscape and weather and emotions being so heightened. I love how I feel. I am so up close and personal with these characters and getting to know them so intimately. It's a big pet peeve of mine when I read a book and I feel like I'm at the end of a long tunnel looking at the characters and wishing that I could get more up close with them. Like I want to know you better. Um, and a book like I, I, I felt like that was the city of bells by Elizabeth Googe and it, it's like I read it and I'm like, I feel kind of, I feel dumb while I'm reading this. I feel like I can't understand these characters and I feel like I'm not picking up on what other readers are picking up while they're reading this. But when I read a book like Wuthering Heights and the other ones I'm going to talk about, I feel like I've gotten to know these characters so well. And I love to read books where the characters feel so flesh and blood and real. So the first on the list is Wuthering Heights and set on the moors, um, set in the landscape that the Brontes uh, lived in, in Haworth, and just absolutely stunning. Uh, I reread it. I was a bit surprised. There wasn't quite as much nature writing as I had remembered, but there is a fair amount in the landscape does. It becomes a character in and of itself. So I think I feel that something about when the landscape is like that, you just are, there's, the characters can't hide. Um, when it's, when it's like that, uh, so, something about it. I don't know. I just feel very up close and personal with the characters. The next book on the list and the book that inspired this video was Grania, the story of an island by Emily Lawless. This is just a stunning, stunning piece of work. I cannot recommend this enough. It's very short. It packs such a punch though. Um, I thought it ended all too soon, but then I thought, well, as I'm, you know, thinking about it and observing it, I don't know how else it should have ended. I don't know what else I would have wanted it to be like, how, how else I thought she could have done it. So I'll just read one little passage. Um, a narrow entrance between two rocks, steep as the sides of a well, led to the door of the cabin. The result being that whenever the wind was to the west or southwest, the two prevailing winds Enter, anyone entering it was caught as by a pair of irresistible hands, twirled for a moment, hither and thither, and then thrust violently forward, impossible to enter quietly. You were shot towards the door, and it proved open. 
and if it proved open, shot forward again, as if discharged from some invisible catapult. So well was the state of affairs understood that a sort of hedge or screen made of heather and known as a corag was kept between the door and the fire, so that entering friends might be checked and hindered from falling, as otherwise they assuredly would have fallen, prone upon the hearthstone. There were a good many other and all more or less futile contrivances upon that little group of wind-worn, wind-tormented islands against their omnipotent master. I, I ended up not underlining anything in this because I would have underlined the entire book. I will definitely be rereading this. This is the story of the title character, Grania, who lives on the Aran Islands. And I think Innis Mas is the one that she lives on. And it's just such this intimate portrait of this little window of time you're getting to see in Grania's life when really, um, or it starts out when she's younger, but the majority of the book happens during this time. Um, when she has to make these significant decisions, she's engaged to, she's betrothed to a man, Murdoch Blake, and she's really contemplating, like, is this the life that I want with him? Is this what I want? Um, she has such a deep and abiding love for this island that she lives on, this really um, kind of like bare, desolate landscape, but it has a haunting beauty of its own. Maybe totally want to visit the Aran Islands, and I really do recommend this book. Like I said, it's really, really short, but it packs quite a punch. So just go in expecting a very short, um, awe-inspiring story. That's all I have to say about Grania. Next on the list is A Welsh Witch by Alan Rain. So this was published in 1902. Technically doesn't qualify as Victorian, but you know what? I say it was written in 1901 then, published in 1902. So it's fine. It's fine. We're just going to qualify it as Victorian. Um, I read this two Victobers ago, and it is about Katrin, who is uh, the protagonist of the story. And she is um, kind of a misanthrope and is very mysterious to people. Um, this is a little shore town. Does it say? Mm. It's in South Wales, they say, but it doesn't necessarily say like when, it doesn't say um, what town it is in specifically, but it's a shore town in Wales. And um, she does not fit in in this village. And so then, since she doesn't fit in, and since she spends her time kind of adventuring around, roaming around this island and is so in tune with the landscape and all these uh, kind of like secret places in the island, she is then labeled as a witch because she is other. And it's really fascinating to see kind of how the, the turn of events that happen because of that. You're following these four main characters and um, even though she's the protagonist of the story, you're following four main characters and seeing their their lives unfold um, in this small little place and, um, they are really kind of bound by the seaside and it's a big income source for the town. And there's, oh, an amazing, amazing scene I will never forget, but it's such a spoiler. So I can't tell you more about it, but it is absolutely stunning. And um, yeah, this is just a really excellent book. And this one is not quite as sad as the other ones. All the ones on this list, unfortunately, are pretty sad books. Um, this one is not as sad. And so I think if you're looking for one that wasn't as sad. And isn't this cover just gorgeous? Okay, next is <laughs> The Return of the Native by Thomas Hardy. I read this in May with... Um, Adam from Memento Mori, Natalie from My Reading Days, and Kate from The Novel Nomad. And we were all so swept away by this book. This is set in Egdon Heath. And uh, there is this kind of, in all of these books that I'm talking about, there's a bit of a claustrophobic feeling where these characters feeling really bound in by the characteristics of the land and just really kind of almost helpless to the, the force of nature that they're living in. And... Um, just the way that Hardy writes in this is sublime. And the Egdon Heath um, setting that, oh, just the different different ways the plot unfolds because of that is absolutely stunning. And um, one of the really interesting char characters in this is Eustacia Vi, which if you watch my Victober video on 
pressing flowers, you'll see why I have this flower pressed in here as a bookmark. Uh, and Eustacia really feels that she is meant for like bigger and better things. And right at the same time, uh, there are a couple who are betrothed and there's kind of a hiccup in um, their getting married. And then you find out more and more details about these characters and all of the, the wheels of the, the, the gears of the story start kind of meshing and intertwining together to be one big, um, as Adam from Memento Mori would say, pain train. Um, so this is a really sad book, but it does have kind of a little redemptive note at the end. I really like that he added it. I think some Hardy fans would be okay with it not even being in there, but I like that he gave us, he gave us that just like the little bit of, of hope in there. Okay, and then lastly on the list for Victorian novels with an otherworldly aesthetic is Sylvia's Lovers. I love this book. I love this book. I read it my very first Victober, and it was definitely a highlight of that Victober for me. If you, um, this is a Gaskell book that I, if you like Elizabeth Gaskell, I can't guarantee that you're going to like this because I know several people that like Gaskell and then were kind of so-so about this. But I think if you like Wuthering Heights, no, because I know Wuthering Heights fans that didn't necessarily love this. So I can't guarantee whether or not you're going to love this. I just know I did. It is set in, um, I always get it wrong because now I know the real name. It's set in Monkshaven, which is supposed to, it's inspired by Whitby, which is a very like Northern English fishing town. And I love how, um, very like everyday, uh, kind of mundane it starts out where Sylvia is going to town. She has money to buy a cloak and she's debating about whether it should be a gray cloak or a red cloak. And, uh, it's just a really, really compelling love triangle story. And uh, Sylvia kind of torn, um, not not really knowing what she wants for her life, feeling really trapped in this really small village um, and wanting more for her life. It's just so beautifully written. This is Elizabeth Gaskell's nature writing at its best. Um, I will look up a passage to read to you. All right, so here's a passage, no spoilers. Starts out with a character named Philip says, Philip walked on pretty briskly, unconsciously enjoying the sunny landscape before him, the crisp curling waves rushing almost up to his feet on his right hand and then swishing back over the fine small pebbles into the great swelling sea. To his left were the cliffs rising one behind another, having deep gullies here and there between with long green slopes upward from the land and then sudden falls of brown and red soil or rock deepening to a yet greater richness of color at their base towards the blue ocean before him. The loud, monotonous murmur of the advancing and receding waters lulled him into dreaminess. The sunny look of everything tinged his daydreams with hope. So he trudged merrily over the first mile or so, not an obstacle to his measured pace on the hard level pavement, not a creature to be seen since he had left the little gathering of bare-legged urchins dabbling in the sea pools near Monkshaven. The cares of land were shut out by the glorious barrier of rocks before him. There were some great masses that had been detached by the action of the weather and lay half embedded in the sand, draperied over by the heavy pendant olive green seaweed. The waves were nearer at this point. The advancing sea came up with a mighty distant length of roar. Here and there, the smooth swell was lashed by the fret against unseen rocks into white breakers. But otherwise, the waves came up from the German Ocean upon that English shore with a long, steady roll that might have taken its first impetus far away in the haunt of the sea serpent on the coast of Norway over the foam. The air was soft as May. Right overhead, the sky was blue, but it deadened into gray near the sea lines. Flocks of seagulls hovered above the white about the edge of the waves, slowly rising and turning their white underplumage to glimmer in the sunlight as Philip approached. The whole scene was so peaceful, so soothing, that it dispelled the cares and fears, too well-founded in fact, which had weighed down on his heart during the dark hours of the past night. And then I realized I had not read a passage from The Return of the Natives, so I will try to find one to read to you. All right, so this is from one of the very, this is from the first chapter. It says, who can say of a particular sea that it is old? Distilled by the sun, kneaded by the moon, it is renewed in a year, in a day, or in an hour. 
The sea changed, the fields changed, the rivers, the villages, and the people changed, yet Egdon remained. Those surfaces were neither so steep as to be destructible by weather, nor so flat as to be the victims of floods and deposits. With the exception of an aged highway and still more aged barrow, presently to be referred to, themselves almost crystallized to natural products by long continuance. Even the trifling irregularities were not caused by pickaxe, plow, or shade, but remained as the very finger touches of the last geological change. I hope I have persuaded some of you to try these. So, in review, Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte, Gronya, The Story of an Island by Emily Lawless. Um, I think the next one I talked about was The Return of the Native by Thomas Hardy, A Welsh Witch by Alan Rain, and Sylvia's Lovers by Elizabeth Gaskell. So thank you for watching, and I'll be back for another video soon.